Ave Maria. Hello, everyone. This is Father Ninian. Uh, he's a priest based in Edinburgh, and he's in the process of starting an oratory um, at the minute. So we pray for we pray for that to to go well. And today our show is on Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity, uh, who Father is very devoted to. Um, and just before we start uh, getting to the questions, uh, I just wanted to ask if all you viewers could, could please uh, like the video and subscribe to help spread carry on the work of Saint Maximilian Kolbe um, for Our Lady's Apostolate uh, and for souls. Um, so welcome, Father. Um, so, uh, Father, if we make it, maybe we could start uh, with, with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. It's part of the Prayer to the Trinity by St. Elizabeth. O oh my God, Trinity whom I adore, help me to forget myself entirely, that I may establish myself in you as still and as calm as though my soul were already in eternity. May nothing disturb my peace or draw me forth from you, O my immutable Lord. But may I penetrate more deeply at every moment into the depths of your mystery. Give peace to my soul, make it your heaven, your cherished dwelling place, and your resting place. Never permit me to leave you there alone, but keep me there all absorbed in you and in living faith, wholly adoring you and wholly yielded up to your creative action. And this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. Um, so perhaps we could start uh, right at the beginning of, of her life, Father. Um, so what what was St. Elizabeth of the Trinity like uh, initially uh, at the beginning of her life as a young girl? Because I've read that apparently she ha used to have quite bad temper tantrums. Yes, um, she was a very intelligent uh, young girl, very sensitive. She would go on to become very accomplished as a pianist and a musician. But usually most people who are given this talent, they do have a fiery um, sort of prima donna uh, mentality at some point. Uh, speculations, the fact that, you know, people have written, well, she was she was born in a very hot summer, July the 18th, 1880. Um, she was born in a military barracks. Uh, these two things, the conditions of her birth and the situation of her youth, how did that contribute to um, this, this terrible character? You see little pictures of her when she was a child. She's holding on to a little doll, um, Jeanette as it is called, and uh, uh, she's scowling. She's she's not it's not a pretty little girl. She's scowling to the camera and holding it. And you can just see the tension in in her jawline and in her forehead and looking at the at the photographer. Um, it might not surprise you to know that when that little doll was used actually by the priest in uh, uh, the nativity scene at one point, uh, she sort of screamed out in church, so, you know, bad priest, bad priest, uh, give me, give me Jeanette back. So yes, as a young girl, um, she did have a fiery temper. It lasted until she was about nine years old. She was, by the time she was seven, preparing for her first Holy Communion, she was threatened with not being able to make her first Holy Communion by her mother, who was a very tender mother, but also could be quite severe. Um, in modern Scots, we would say that she would give her a good scalp, uh, a slap uh, when necessary, in order to control when it was very bad ill discipline. But in actual fact, the main thing that uh, was used as a punishment was that she would de be deprived from having a good night bedtime kiss. And this this would really this would really make the little girl you know sort of resolve to, um, I suppose reform in the morning. And speaking of reform, there was the threat of reform school. And she was told that uh, if you know she she didn't basically um, shape up, she would have to ship out. And the poor wee girl though, age seven, preparing for her first um, uh, holy communion, 
that's the year that she also lost both her grandfather, who was a great patriarch for the whole family, but also her own father at the same time. And so it was a great toll, this loss on the family. And really, I think those uh, two deaths, as well as the spiritual desire to be united with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament for the first time, as well as her first confession, and, you know, having to be reconciled with God, having to be re reconciled with our neighbour sacramentally, um, then she was able to, well, perform heroic virtue. According to her age, her iron will had to be bent. She had to overcome herself and she had to allow God to do the rest. It's also at this time, though, that she did say that she wanted to become a nun. She even, the same, I think it's the same priest, somebody might correct me, but the priest that had the little doll, um, it's the same priest later that she said, I, I will be a nun. I want to be a nun. It wasn't a, sort of a, a gentle um, affirmation. So she was very lively and vivacious amongst the limited school friends that she had because she was educated privately in the way that they were in the 19th century. Um, she was a leader and she was very much appreciated by her friends. She was very affectionate. She would be a great storyteller. And people wanted to be around her, um, probably because she had a great sense of, 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 of herself. And that temper, therefore, on the one hand, was the negative aspect, but on the other hand, um, uh, it, it could, being very devout um, uh, and, and growing in that in her piety, it meant also that she would, um, the authority was used in a good way. Yes. It's quite incredible, really, that at such a young age, around seven or so, uh, she was already seriously thinking about reforming herself, making resolutions. Um, and I, I remember reading that she was she would write letters to her mother at the age of about seven or eight uh, or nine, uh, describing her resolutions for the new year of re re reforming herself in those in the weaknesses that she had. I mean, you know, for for someone so young, a child, barely only just getting getting the age of reason to re already so resolute on improving is quite incredible. Um, yes. And so she, she discerned the call uh, at a very young age, around this age that you said, you know, um, as a young girl, really, she was already desiring to be a religious. And how did her mother react to it once her mother found out um, that her daughter wanted to be religious? Was there resistance on her mother's part? So uh, with the death of her father, there was great straits to the personal circumstances of the Cates family. Um, uh, there was a little pension to live off, but they did come from, you know, a genteel background, uh, a bourgeois background, and they had to move from uh, accommodation, which was very generous, to a small apartment. I've stood on the spot where that small apartment is uh, in Dijon. It's now a car park, so there's nothing romantic to, to, to meditate or to think upon. Um, it's gone now, uh, but the the impression that you get from being in Dijon as well that it is a is a the place where um, there is great civility of life and um, certainly the discreet generosity of both her um, family and friends allowed them to at least have the facade or the veneer of um, uh, that status that they once had, but. It, they, they weren't poor by any means, but they certainly had to watch economically what was going on. And that also meant that they were a very tight knit unit as a family. And it was it was just Elizabeth, her younger sister, younger by two years, Marguerite, who was a much more gentle character uh, than uh, as a child, but throughout actually, um, than, than Elizabeth was. Her mother, when the call was made known to her, um, really struggled. She resisted the vocational calling of her eldest daughter. In fact, you could even say that she was horrified with the idea of losing her daughter. By the time of her 16th birthday, or just before that, her intentions were made very clear. But it should be noted that for St Elizabeth, she by the time she was about 14 years old, she'd already made a private vow of virginity. And this came about after uh, after Holy Mass one day and in the Thanksgiving post Missam, um, she also realised that it was for karma 
and that, you know, uh, this had been growing, of course, the family apartment is just around the corner from Carmel, that Carmel and Dijon, that they knew you can still visit the wall, the exterior wall and the gate, but that's disappeared. But ultimately, there was this forbidden element. So it was been growing from the time of our first Holy Communion, this intimacy with God. Um, but uh, our mother would forbid the idea of entering Carmel. She would obey. Um, she would also find that her mother would become very unwell. You see pictures of Madame Cates. She's She looks much older than she is, and that's partly strain, and also partly that she suffered from the venom of a snake bite, and that darkened her skin, but also reduced her, I suppose, her, um, her ability to um, sustain infection and so on. Um, her mother, when she became ill, she thought that she would never be able to enter Carmel ultimately because she would have to look after her mother and so this is when she decided really in a sense to become a Carmel light in the world the essence of the vocation um, the essence of prayer uh, and of sacrifice well she would learn that over a period of three years living as a Carmelite in the world as she would put herself after all she, she only lived till she was 26 years on earth and 21 of those years was outside of the walls of Carmel um yeah, there was there was definitely uh, this resistance, and even the fact that the mother would, when she did consent, because she could see that Elizabeth Elizabeth's health was failing by the time she was about seventeen, and she she kind of realised that her daughter was in her obedience was also kind of turning in on herself, and her own situation was becoming rather weak. She consented that she would consider it possible for her to enter Carmel age twenty one and she would have to wait. Um, this discouraged her at first. It was a further years of waiting. You know, it was a period of maturity for her. Um, she yes. didn't lose any time. and But she also didn't close herself up in, in a type of artificial cloister. She used the world as her cloister, and she enjoyed God and all the good things in that period. Yes, yes. Um, and... I I remember reading she was yes she was still very sociable uh, enjoying life to the full um in that period of waiting um meeting people and you know going to parties but still her friends would realize that she was even at parties very very centered and on god um very recollected as well as at the same time being very present to everyone she was with um I think I would say that she didn't want to go to soirees and you know, she, her husband was uh, uh, was in banking and it was kind of important for him to be accompanied by his wife to these particular events and so on. Uh, she encouraged her to say, you know, you be the one that is adoring Christ in the midst of what might even be near occasion of sin. You know, you be the one which is adoring Christ at the dance. Um, I don't know if you remember the story about like St. Therese. I think St. Therese prays that Celine doesn't go to a dance, that she protects her, her virtue in that way. No, you, you get the opposite from, you're getting from inside Carmel, you get letters going out saying, <laughs> enjoy all the good things of which that God has given, which is including the company of others and so on and so forth. But you need to be, even in a situation where you may think that there is sin present you need to be the one that's adoring god there and and that is a, i think that makes saint elizabeth also a very appealing person because it it makes us realize that rather than um because it's not it isn't always possible to 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 avoid obligations and so we therefore have to um uh you know not just make the best of the situation but uh give glory to god in those situations so yeah yes yes uh, and around this period um, of of waiting, uh, waiting to enter the Carmel. That was when she obtained a copy of Saint Therese's autobiography, um, who had died just two years previously. So, could you speak a bit about the influence that Saint Therese and her spirituality had on uh, Saint Elizabeth's own relationship with God? Yes, yeah, Saint Therese is the near contemporary of uh, Saint Elizabeth, and of course, I think a lot of people have seen the fact that you know this is a little image here of of, of Saint Elizabeth, and maybe if you didn't know that it was her, you might think it was Saint Therese of Lisieux. And um, I think a lot of people think that somehow that um, Saint Elizabeth is is the the the, the Dijon, the south 
Eastern French version of the Normandy saint. Um, of course, her life mirrored her a great deal, especially their family backgrounds, family tragedies, um, the circumstances uh, in the sense of, you know, if you follow a pattern of things. But indeed, um, most Carmelites, when you when you read their lives, they kind of all seem to follow a similar pattern, in, uh, you know, especially since they're following in the traditions of La Madre, St. Teresa of Avila. But yes, there was a great influence of St. Teresa of Lisieux and uh, uh, as the little flower with her little way in the spirituality um, that affected uh, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity and her own relationship with God. One of the prayers that um, she found particularly powerful from Therese was the prayer of oblation to the merciful love of God. However, she also then took that prayer and then she developed her own prayer and she talked about how she wanted to become another Bethany of um, Jesus, or for Jesus, sorry, um, to dwell in. So yes, she is our near contemporary. There is much where you, if you read the critical edition, the ICS, the, you know, was it the International Carmelite Studies editions, of um, the life of uh, St. Elizabeth, you'll find lots of notes which, which show you that in actual fact, uh, what appear to be original thoughts of St. Ter- uh, Elizabeth are garnered or harvested consciously or, or not consciously from notes about the life of St. Therese and the little flower. But it also has to be said that they received spiritual conferences and they read the same books from priests and so on of the same generation. So they were they were eating from the same table in that way. And so, yes, there, there was obviously, uh, you, I think the best way to look at it is that by two years after the death of St. Therese, who said that she would do more good in heaven than she did on earth, well, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity is already the first fruits of that harvest. She's the first blooming of uh, the wealth of our own spirituality being read, being digested, and being put into practice. And that's no bad thing. Hmm. Yes. Um, And so eventually, um, to St. Elizabeth's great joy, she she entered the Carmel. And could you describe a bit what her first months were like um, in her postulancy um, once she finally entered the uh the religious life she'd so long uh, longed for um she enters carmel on the 2nd of august 1901 um she she calls this the anticipation of heaven in her letter she writes various versions of this she says you know it's heaven on earth it's god in my soul she enters carmel as a postulant she'd already been a type of postulant outside the walls and had been given instruction along with a number of other young girls who were um um, hoping to enter by um, being instructed by the mother prioress. Um, she did want to be Elizabeth of Jesus for her religious name, and she was actually quite disappointed at first when she was given Elizabeth of the Trinity. But she would later see that there was a very there was a prophetic choice in that name, and she would go on to absorb the meaning of that name, especially on the first feast of the Trinity in Carmel. Um, she says, she writes about the fact that, you know, on this feast day, that's her feast day with the three. Um, it's a feast of silence and adoration, she writes. And she says that the mystery and the whole of our vocation is to be contained in this name. Um, you know, there are photographs of the young postulant which are taken uh, while she's there and sent to the Carmel and the zoo. This is very common, you know, the, 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 the convents uh, communicating with each other. But on the back of the postcard or the, the photograph, they write that Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity will be a saint, for she already has remarkable dispositions for it. So, you know, there's there's already a recognition of her holiness amongst very holy women um, themselves. She'll be clothed on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the 8th of December, 1901, and then things do change for her. There's a, there's a darkness, there's a bewilderment, uh, there's interior suffering, and prayer suddenly is no longer easy. And, um, you know, that, that's that's quite a contrast to her period as a postulant, where I think, you know, fireworks are kind of going off in, in, in her life. And the novitiate is a very, uh, yeah, a time of great struggle. This will come to an end uh, in 1903, uh, January 11th, when she makes her first profession of vows, and the cloud seems to be lifted. 
and swiftly she's taken on a path to holiness and heaven is again uh, more present. This anticipation of heaven is more present. And she really sees herself in that Carmelite tradition of praying as an apostle, um, an enclosed apostle, but um, drinking from the living spring of water, um, living close to the author of all grace so that others can um, experience uh, the infinite through her prayers. And, um, you know, she be like most Carmelites, because they consider themselves really to follow the rule of St. Paul, she becomes a, a, a beloved officer. She calls my she calls St. Paul my beloved St. Paul. And this is when she then adopts a little nickname for herself. Um, a, she calls herself Laudem Gloriae, um, which is the praise of glory. She calls herself this, but is also her vocation. And she takes that from St. Paul's um, letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 12. So, um, yes, she, she, she has, you know, Carmel is not an easy experience. It's a, a period of interior darkness, but it still remains the port for heaven. Mm. Yes. And in terms of getting used to the way of life, um, it seems that she adapted quite quickly in terms of the rule, um, the austerities, like the cold, the cold, she would get chill, chill blains in her hands because there was no heating. Um, so I think, yeah, one could see her strength of will and taking all the, all the sacrifices and all the sufferings that came with, with an austere rule of life like that. Um, yes. And, and her desire for sanctity, she, she, she wholeheartedly embraced it all and, and was grateful, grateful for all, all the sacrifices that were, that were required of her. Um, once, once she entered um, this religious life, um, could you describe a bit further about uh, what was what was her way of prayer? Um, for example, the role of silence. What role of silence had in her prayer, and the emphasis on her relationship with the Trinity uh, dwelling within her soul? There's a total uh, forgetfulness of self. I think that's what comes about uh, in her through her prayer. Um, she's even teased by the sisters in her love of prayer. Now, obviously, there are lots of external rules of prayer um, uh, and there are external observances of silence, but there's a, a type of teasing that goes on, in fact, that that's, you know, silence for her was obviously the means of a great happiness. And um, without uh, reserve, she gave herself up to the welcome gift of silence as the welcome gift of God himself. Um, in the beatification sermon given by John Paul II in 1984, um, he speaks about that how silence uh, was practiced by her to an exceptional degree and that um, she was aware, therefore, in silence of the communion of God. And that, that really, I suppose, of her prayer um, is, uh, is, the, is the most valuable lesson that we get, which is the reflection of God dwelling within us and also God dwelling in everything in sort of God's presence in the cosmos, um, uh, his redemption of the universe. Um, you know, eternity begins, um, but it's still in progress. And she wanted to sh share that with others, of course, as well. But that's what she shares directly with God, um, eternity. Yes. And just yeah on on the point of her emphasis on silent prayer um when i think lent was approaching um all the sisters other sisters it might have been during the period of novitiate were talking about all the devotions that they were going to take on the rosaries the uh, novenas and everything that they were going to take on um in, in preparation for lent and you know they are they asked her knowingly you know was she just going to embrace more silence and she just nodded um so her way was a, a very kind of simple simple way of prayer um yes yes and also during the work i think she would she during her work she would be very absorbed uh absorbed in god absorbed in prayer um that sometimes the sisters would they wanted to go and ask her for something for some help with something but then they see how absorbed she was in prayer and god then they then they just they'd leave the thing unasked and then just leave leave her in peace um just like when she was back when she was in the world and she was so absorbed in god despite being in a party or in a dance. Um, yes. 
And um, Father, could you also uh, please talk a bit about her great charity for others? Uh, for example, the charity she had for her sisters within the convent and also the charity she still had uh, towards her friends and family outside the convent, uh, sending lots of letters to them, consoling them, encouraging them. Yeah, I think the wonderful thing about being able to read the letters which are being collated is that you you can understand that she really wants to um, share the the glory of which that she's participating in in Carmel, and she wants to be involved with others. She tells, I don't know whether she made these arrangements before she went into Carmel, uh, I can't quite recall. I think she did, actually, because the letters already speak at the very beginning of, um, remember that we have a special time to think of each other, that we have a special prayer to 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 say and to be in with each other. And she writes to friends and family and so on and so forth like this. I think it's a, a you know a wonderful sign that she was already preparing that there would be a barrier between how you know she would be able to love them from behind um, uh, the you know behind the grill. Uh, I mean, the family, even though maybe if you get the impression that there was a strictness in the family or there was a, this discipline in the family and there was this turbulent child and all that. I mean, on the day that Madame Cates and Marguerite had to allow her to enter Carmel, they went back home, literally just walking a few, you know, it's, it's only it's like 500 yards, um, a few minutes walk. They went back home and they sat in the living room in complete silence themselves, feeling like there was a death. They didn't speak, they didn't eat. There was just this, 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 this sense of loss, while of course just round the corner and over the wall, there was a sense of great gain that had come about the the acquiescence of a, a vocation, the ability to try it. So um, Elizabeth is trying to, um, from using her letters, she's trying to maintain those affectionate ties. She she even, um, you know, in the way that she signs off to her mother in her letters, she makes a deliberate decision to do so, uh, you know, using a pet name, um, you know, just as a little encouragement to, you know, she hasn't lost a daughter just because she's become a religious sister. Uh, and she's, she's yeah, she's always trying to be this supportive encouragement to the way in which others um, be involved in their lives as much as she can, but more importantly, in, to try to insert the presence of God into their lives continuously, especially when they have troubles and various difficulties and, and things that come up, or if there's this feeling of separation. And as I said, if you know that someone is praying with you and united with you at a certain hour every day, or that you have a special prayer that you say union, well, mystically speaking, the union of souls, therefore, is it probably is of greater benefit to us than maybe um, frequent contact, which is superficial. You know, this is much more intense and mysterious. Yes, yes. And apparently her volume of letters during this period when she was in the comment was was very large. Um, her, you know, kind of this apostolate, shall we say, to those outside, um, just shows her, her charity. Um, and how about also, Father, her, her charity for the sisters within the convent? Um, I think that was that was something a lot of other other sisters noticed was her considerate considerateness and kindness towards them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think already if you've got them saying as a postulant that she's got the means of becoming a saint, mm -hmm. um, then you know recognition from those who are around her. This is in contrast to if you remember, you know, Saint Therese, who is kind of uh, seen as a flippity gibbet, uh, fifteen year old. Uh, she can't clean correctly. She needs to be taught to do everything, and so on and so forth. You know, yeah. Elizabeth comes in with a strength of character, maturity of being uh, tried uh, in her years. Uh, this this type of leadership that she exudes um, is is affectionate and reverential and supportive. Um, and the sisters, they, they they gain a direct benefit from that. You know, it's, it's, she's a joy to have in the community. And um, uh, I think there's a lasting legacy of of St. Elizabeth's behaviour, really, um, which is celebrated by the convent even today in Dijon. Mm. And um, so a, a while after, after the novitiate, then um, her main cross, which was to be her, her calvary, um, was being diagnosed with Addison's disease. Um, so could you speak a little bit further about how her heroically she she carried that cross and you know how serious and debilitating this disease was? Okay, so Addison's disease today is, is also very serious. Um, there are medicines to treat and 
I don't know if one can possibly say, you know, an, an absolute cure. Um, the adrenaline glands which sit above your kidneys, they stop working and you don't get the hormones that you need. Um, uh, you're, the, you don't have any energy. You become very weak. You become very thirsty. You have a low mood. And there are various crises. If you look up Addison's disease on like the NHS, NHS website or indeed any medical encyclopedia, you see all the various different things that can happen with un untreated Addison's disease. And the list is just enormous. Um, one of the things that you'll see from her photographs, for instance, at this period is the darkening of the skin. And to the point of where if you didn't know that she had Addison's disease, obviously there's a strain around her temples um, and uh, th th there's, there's certainly she's uh, for the for the sake of the photography, putting on um, the best possible position. But you can see it's someone who who who's, who does struggle. She's holding a rosary beads. The cross is very prominent on it. And um, well, if you go ever go to Dijon, you can venerate um, these items, which have all been preserved in a little museum. But um, two years before she died, in 1905, symptoms of Addison's disease start to appear. Um, she writes to one of her friends, um, Framboza. I'm just going to. I'm just going to quote, you know, the, uh, what she says, um, uh, but she summarizes and when she says about, obviously, St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, she says, you know, in my own flesh, I fill up what is lacking in the passion of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. And, um, you know, this is a, our crown of suffering um, is actually the the means of happiness. She she talks about how this unity with Christ, this conformity with Christ, therefore is the instrument and the means of which she can also obtain happiness. So she, her attitude to her suffering and towards um, death in the main is not one which, which is someone who is afraid. Um, uh, I suppose she's already for the greatest part gone through the dark night of the soul previously. And she's she's supported by that experience. Mm. Yes, and as as the illness was progressing, um, for as long as she could, she would heroically do her utmost to keep up with the life, the regular life of the community, the life of prayer, yes. of self sacrifice, and the duties of the community, despite the disease making her so weak that she could barely walk up the stairs. Um, yes, again shows her incredible strength, strength of will, um, and then. Yes, and then as you say, Father, she wasn't afraid of death. As death was approaching, she was she looked forward with great longing, great longing to, to death and mm -hmm. oh, to, yes. to be united to, to heaven and to be united with with Jesus. Um, and as the as the illness progressed more and more, um, what was those those last last few weeks, last few months like um, when it was getting very very intense? You know, when she had to have, for example, her stomach getting pumped by the doctors. Yeah. And she was just in agonizing pain and fits fits of pain going into the night and things like that. So um, she has to be moved to the infirmary. And uh, yes, what 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 limited care that could be provided for her was given according to the, the, the age and the time. It should be noted that she got no more, no less um medical care than what could have been provided in the carmel you know there wasn't a deliberate sort of renunciation of the ability to provide comfort to her or anything like that um but she wants to allow others in she wants the focus i would say to be placed away from herself and on uh, and, and on and on a mission um to allow others to experience what she uh is holding on to herself in, in the love of God. And again, I just will quote from a little letter that she wrote. Um, she says that her final mission, she says, is to draw souls by helping them go out of themselves to cling to God by a holy, simple and loving movement and to keep them in this great silence within that will allow God to communicate himself to them and transform them into himself. So she's she wants she wants the lesson of her illness to be a means of others, I suppose. And I've been very ill myself, you know, previously in life, um, and I can understand this. Is to get is is to remove the temptation of self pity, 
and to really allow that experience to be whereby you cling to God simply, as she says there, and, and to experience in the silence of the suffering that God is communicating something to you. You know, and I mean, it's been, it's not my, uh, it's not the words of St. Elizabeth, it's not my words either, but, you know, illness can often be like God speaking on a megaphone. And um, the megaphone is very, very loud. And so uh, we're not quite sure what the message is, I suppose. Um, we know that there's an alert coming towards us. And, you know, the simpler the message, the easier it is to be understood in the megaphone. And um, if we take away the noise value of it, I think that's also the way in which that we approach God in silence. Silence can sometimes be very deafening and we don't really know how to, we feel that we're not in control of the situation in silence because we like to talk and we like activity. Um, but ultimately, uh, she wanted others to know that they are loved by God and they need to listen to that lesson. I mean, one of the things she writes to her prioress, um, Mother uh, Germaine, um, it's one of her, la one of her, it's not the last letter, but one of her last letters. Um, she writes to her and says that she needs to allow herself to be loved. Um, she tells her that she is uncommonly loved. And she tells her again, let yourself be loved more than the others, meaning more than the other sisters. You know, there's this great positive affirmation of the uniqueness of each individual soul. And in the sense that, yes, of course, in humility, we would put others first, especially in the position of a superior. You'd want to put all your activities that your daughters come first. Yes, he says, let yourself be loved more than others. And in that sense, I suppose the containment in one soul is, is God himself and the fullness of his love that he wants to, um, uh, he wants for you alone as if nobody had ever been created other than yourself. Nobody had ever been redeemed other than yourself. And that's the lesson that she's teaching from the infirmary. Yes. And she, you know, and she herself in all these letters, uh, demonstrated such a love herself as well for for others for the sisters and still when she could barely write at this point barely write um she wrote uh, she wrote in pencil over several days a few pages i believe it was to a child i believe it was to a, ch a childhood friend of hers and um, then it took her several days to write it because she was so weak that she could barely hold the pencil but it just showed again shows her inc incredible um love and concern for others in the midst of like our lord in the midst of her calvary um uh, okay, thank you very much, Father. Um, and yes, and then after this protracted illness, and then um, she she passed away fairly serenely, I, I believe, Father. Uh, and the end, the last, of course, in the build-up there was agonies, but right at the end, mm -hmm. uh, serenity. I I, I read. Um, you know, I, my memory is failing me about the exactness of of her of her death. But yes, I think that that is very accurate. That's very accurate about that. You know, um, she. Uh, I think, like many, therefore, those who are ready for heaven when it when it when it arrives, um, therefore, um, uh, there is a, the there is therefore the, the storm is 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 behind them. But uh, yeah, I can't. I can't. I, I will be honest. I know the, the specifics of that, that particular chapter. I couldn't tell you much more. No, no problem, Father. Um, so, Father, you personally, I know you, you have a very big devotion to um, to St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. So if I could ask, uh, what was it particularly about her, her life, or about her spirituality that drew you, uh, that drew you to her? So um, in 2004... I was given um, uh, copies that someone didn't need anymore of the, at that time, the collected works, which were just volume one and volume, volume two. Now we have volume three. And uh, I, I devoured them. I reread them. It seemed that she was going to be my spiritual sister in heaven and powerful intercessor. I did all this before I'd, um, reread the story of a soul at the time uh, I'd read that to me in the first reading the image of Saint Therese the way in which she's portrayed even physically in the, the way in which that many statues are kind of you know she's far too much foundation on and too bright 
red lipstick and so on. She didn't seem to have a depth of character. All of that's now changed, but uh, in my in my love of Saint Therese as well. But at the time, um, Saint Elizabeth seemed to really speak to me as a as a. I was a religious brother myself, and uh, the dedication that she expressed uh, was an ideal that I would hope to um, live up to. Uh, you know, falling far short, I needed to be able to have somebody in which to intercede for me. It turns out that, you know, she ends up being canonized October the 16th in 2016, which is the year that I myself was eventually ordained to the sacred priesthood. So the year of my ordination. I did the majority of my priestly training in Belgium and I visited the Carmel of Ghent and there met uh, quite casually uh, the great Conrad, Conrad de Meester, the translator and author of these collected works. I, you know, I, I think we it was after someone's diaconate ordination and we were in the refectory, beautiful, beautiful convent in of itself, but um, you know, over some super something and you're introducing yourself to her and he said his name is Conrad, Conrad. And, you know, I was very much uh, surprised. I said, oh, hold on, what, what's your surname? You know, and, and there's man to be beside me. And ultimately, he is also the one uh, got speaking to him and later also got to visit for another event. I can't remember what it was, but got to be able to visit um, uh, a... Uh, and to, to to briefly meet the the lady who had the cure, which which was used for the canonization process, mm -hmm. and so um, in speaking to him, who was also the um, I can't remember if he was the vice postulator or if he had some significant process, but you know, developing sort of relationship with Carmel in the main, she's always been a bit of a forerunner for that, and eventually I would find myself at the Carmel and Dijon, which is not a pretty place. It's a beautiful landscape, it's set in wonderful hills and countryside and so on. So the convent is just a big block of concrete. Um, it could be an Aldi, a Lidl, a Tesco, um, you wouldn't really know. And um, thankfully, things have been slightly beautified as time has gone on as well. There's a wonderful statue uh, of St. Elizabeth of Trinity outside. Um, which is which is also replicated with a similar statue down in the town of Dijon, um, and you can follow a trail of heart through the city. It's kind of signposted. There's been a Carmel in Dijon for centuries, though they've moved a few times. Um, yeah, it's a it's a fascinating city in itself. But yeah, I was very defensive of uh, Saint Elizabeth. I felt like I had to fight her corner, and you know, against you kind of forgotten you. You know, if you think about. Um, St. Teresa of, uh, of Avila and St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Lisieux and um, St. Teresa Benedicta of Cruce and she's kind of, you know, kind of forgotten about. There's also another connection in her life, which is with myself, um, uh, with a Belgian mystic. She herself, especially in her last years, found a great deal of meaningful reflection in the life of Blessed uh, John, Blessed Jan van Roosbroek. And then um, Blessed John Rosebrook lived in the 13th and 14th century and, and a deep mystical level about the indwelling of, of Christ and the indwelling of the Trinity within himself. And of course, that all appealed to her. And I had also read his works. So it was like as if we were friends whereby I could read her letters and, and so on. We kind of appreciate each other as, as you know, as, as persons and, and see her as a sister who can provide for me spiritually, but also that we had things in common as well. And, um, and in that sense, yeah. It, okay. It, it grew. Yes. And thanks, Peter. What a blessing for uh, you to be able to be so involved uh, with people so involved in her canonization process. Um, people who, who knew her knew her knew her story so well that's a real blessing yeah um providentially then, it's appealed ac accidentally you know right well yes exactly and then father also um i was going to ask was she because because her main emphasis of spirituality is of course on the trinity the indwelling of the holy trinity um is she known at all for her devotion to mary or did she have a strong relationship devotion to our blessed lady well she's of course as a daughter of carmel you know <laughs> our lady of mount carmel um uh, her scapula um the the garment of uh, of salvation you know the, the garment of grace the, the garment of salvation 
very important to her, this uniform um, with its particular promises and indulgences attached to it. I mean, that's obvious, the praying of the Holy Rosary. Um, her relationship with Our Lady was that she saw in her as the perfect example of a soul of prayer, not just a soul who prays, but a soul of prayer, a bit like um, St. Francis did not say, you know, who became prayer. And, um, you know, there's a famous prayer that she herself wrote, um, uh, you know, uh, the renewal of her vows on November the 21st, 1904, which is the, you know, the prayer of um, the Holy Trinity. Um, and it's written on the feast day of what is the presentation of Our Lady, but it has the perspective almost of Our Lady at the Annunciation. And again, if you just allow me to quote a little bit from what she writes about Our Lady, and she says that the Spirit of God come upon me as you came upon the chaos of the world, as you came upon the Virgin Mary to create in her our Lord. And she speaks about her life as type, as a type of being the womb of Our Lady, you know, at the Annunciation. And indeed, as she also talks about her life as being, in its, in its apostolic sense, as being uh, following in her steps to uh, the visitation. After all, she's also Elizabeth. Um, in 1906, she wrote two treaties that we can still read. One is called Heaven and Faith, and the other is called Last Retreat where she has a great exposition of Mary, and she uses the various titles of Our Lady within, within that treatise, she, you know, Speculum Justitiae, you know, the, um, the Mirror of Justice, or the Virgo Fidelis, the Faithful Virgin, and she basically exposes about how that the spirituality of Our Lady and her vocation um, are, are united together, and, and there's a, a bottomless depth um, of how Mary is our model, um, and uh, an example for peace and for adoration. Yeah, you know, you, you couldn't get a soul closer. Um, after all, if she has the Trinity, if, if the Trinity is at the focus of her indwelling, then Mary, who is the spouse, who is the, you know, who is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, who is the mother of, of, of God, yeah, she has to be there all the time. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, before we just one more question from myself before we go into the audience questions is for us today, Father, um, who are seeking holiness in union with God. Uh, what would you say, Elizabeth, Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity, can, Elizabeth of the Trinity, can teach all of us? She only had twenty six years on earth. She died on the ninth um, of November, nineteen hundred and six, and her feast day is the day before the eighth of November. She only had twenty six years, and that was sufficient um, for her to come to realization that eternity is now. You know, it's unfolding, but it's also now. Um, the Carthusians use the phrase "hic et nunc," here and now, and this realization in our own age uh, of uh, seeking love in places where it should not be and cannot be found in the sense of its genuine love, agape love, sacrificial love, the love that um, knows no bounds, that um, places others first, um, that excites humility and meekness and generosity in our souls. Well, St. Elizabeth has all this and she has all this to share with us, that loving God comes first and that our search for love when we do so, we often make mistakes in substituting that divine love for human love, for temporary love, for artificial love, almost in, in many different ways. That holiness being set apart for God, seeking union with God, um, al allowing ourselves, therefore, to be loved by God. This is one of the prime messages that I think is overlooked and in the, the, the difficulties and the trauma of our modern age, um, uh, people, uh, you know, there are so many people who have mental health problems. They speak about psychology and psychiatry as if it was just from one breath to the next. Uh, but one of the things of, that, that would bring great healing is allowing yourself to be loved by God in the indwelling that is within you. Firstly, on a natural theological level, as the creature of God, then at the supernatural level, of course, after our christening, our baptism, and the graces that flow from that. And I think, therefore, that, yeah, she has a lot to, to teach, but a lot to suck her, because she's familiar with our struggles. You know, she's familiar with 
that bad temper that needs to be overcome and the anger and passions that need to be an iron will that has to be uh, not, not sharpened, but rather softened by um, by the work of God. She's familiar, you know, familiar with so many people who come. Yes, her family wasn't a broken family, but from an early death or from a family situation that's changed, economic situation and expectations which are different, and then that leads to a whole... She's familiar in the way that she has a mother who, who, you know, what is tender and gentle, but at the same time it can be strict and, and with discipline, you know, I, I wouldn't use the word selfish, but in the sense of, you know, she wants her daughter with her and she wants to contain her and she she doesn't, you know, she, she wants it for her own rather than for herself. But, you know, all these things that, yes, when people are growing up in the way in which that they, they, they have to develop on a human formation level, she, she's familiar with those struggles. She's, she's close enough in time to us. She's just over 100 years past. She's close enough in time that the things that um, we deal with today, she had to deal with then. And that makes her also very relevant. Thank you very much, Father. Okay, so now we can go on to some of the questions from the, the viewers. Um, so we have greetings, many people uh, saying Ave Maria to to you, Father. Uh, from Carol Smith, greetings saying Ave Maria, and uh, Mikhail, and Heidi. Um, okay, so the first question is from Carol Smith. She asks, it seems a lot of the Carmelite nuns die very young. Can you give a reason for that, Father? Uh, <laughs> if I knew the mind of God. <laughs> uh, you know, La Madre lives quite a long life, doesn't she? St. Teresa of Avila lives quite a long life. Um, uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Teresa Benedicta Cruce, uh, sadly, you know, her life is taken from her, but it's also, um, you know, late middle age. Uh, so some of the greats do do live longer, um, but uh, yes, I think that the divine spouse wants his brides with him, and just as we know that Saint Therese says, you know, I will do you know greater things yet, and I will spend my heaven sending down roses and so forth. I mean, if we are, if we really consider our lives that this is a veil, very thin veil between what we experience in flesh and blood and that which we experience in the spirit, then indeed, uh, you know, if our life can come to fulfillment and to its apex um, here and now, after all, our Lord only required 33 years and he's the perfect man, um, then I, yeah, my explanation is perhaps inadequate, but I, I, I think that um, the eternal youth of, uh, of a soul, after all, we are to be like children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, then, uh, yeah, I think I think our Lord calls them sooner rather than later um, into His presence. And just a greeting here from Alison Cassidy. Great to see Father Ninian. He was in Dundee for a few years. Great supporter of the Legion of Mary and the Latin Mass Society. God bless you all. Um, okay, so the next question. Um, isn't uh, we've you've talked a little bit about this father but from Heidi isn't she the saint of suffering um please comment on her serenity and her great suffering oh yes uh I think that's also an inspiration for myself I you know it took 11 years between beginning and end for me to enter religious life and and to find myself ordained a priest and to fulfill that vocation. And part of that was changing countries and learning a new language and, and so forth. Um, there's also maybe something of the fact that I was like heart to learn the value of, um, of, of being sick. And, you know, I was a hospital chaplain in Dundee. I'm now a hospital chaplain in Edinburgh. And, uh, you know, the, the, the cry of the sick bed brings us into great familiarity with Christ on the cross. And uh, she teaches us in, in, in yeah, she, she, that's a good word to use, the serenity of the sick bed. Um, she's not uh, filled with, anything other than a desire to convert that experience into a positive one, to utilize her time to the best 
of her ability. I remember also doing the same, you know, uh, whether it was weeks in the hospital or whatever, do, you know, writing my own little orarium of the prayers I should say and what I should do and acts of this or that, and to adapt according to whether, you know, you're able or fit and, and to look forward to um, trying to experience uh, the visits of others as the visits of Christ and all these types of things. And I think that, yeah, she she gives us that example of whereby uh, it is suffering is 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 has its use has its utility um she says it herself i quoted already today you know that making up for that which is lacking in the passion of christ is there anything lacking in the redemption of christ no of course not but there is what's lacking in us um and uh making up for that and 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 vicariously um using that uh united with the cross for for others thank you um the next question this is from radio Maculata. Uh, did St. Elizabeth write anything other than her letters, a diary or spiritual reflections? Yes, I think I mentioned two there that she wrote from her retreats. So in the three volumes that you have, um, you, you, you have you have retreat notes, not just her letters and her correspondence. Um, and she does she does have a type of um, spiritual diary that can that's can that's compiled from all of that. Her um, prioress, she writes the first book about her, which is Praise of Glory. Um, but it's not anything like uh, A Story of a Soul. You don't have a Dijon version of Story of a Soul. It's not quite like that. Hmm. But well, well worth reading, though, her letters. Um... Oh yeah, just, absolutely. Just, the three yeah. volumes, you know, it's, it, the letters are fantastic. I, I, yeah. you know, I, I have a former prisoner who, um, you know, is a Carmelite postulant and is God willing, um, you know, it's very soon going to be clothed in the Carmelite habit. And when I was reading the letters, I suppose this is maybe the common theme uh, in Carmelite vocation. But when I was reading the letters to Elizabeth, you know, I said to um, the postulant's mother, I said, it's like I'm listening to her voice again. You know, right. it's this very this 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 um this lively and 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 loving um voice from behind uh, the the cloister grill and yeah certainly Elizabeth Elizabeth's letters will will perk you up if you're feeling down. There's no doubt about it. And you know, you, you want to take notes and you want to take little bits out. But yeah, she does write treaties of a sort. Her retreat notes and her and her little special um uh, you know uh, re reflections. Um, mm. uh, according to time, uh, some of them are, are, as I've said there already. So you know they're borrowed material, but you know Saint Ignatius of Loyola, um, the thirty-day exercises are all borrowed material. It's a matter okay. about presenting material in such a way that other others can utilize it and use it and and benefit from it. That also makes you know that, that makes something kind of a spiritual genius. Yes, and also coming as well with the addition of her own experience, personal experience. Um, oh yeah, with, absolutely. With through in her so writing, anybody can buy the th three volumes that are, you know, uh, going around with the international, the ICS editions, the International Carmelite Studies editions. They're easily available. You also showed me, brother, a book that's very close to my heart, um, which is from the same thing, which I have sitting beside here. He is my heaven. If anybody's wondering about what's the easiest way in which to delve into um, uh, St. Elizabeth of Trinity, this book, which is by Jennifer Moorcroft, this is a fantastic little book. And in the prayer group that I used to have in Dundee with the ladies, I, I think it might even be this one. I had to make sure I put ex libris to get it back because yeah. it was doing all the rounds. And it's a very, it's a very easy read, very popular and very uplifting read, you know, about the fellowship in suffering especially as well and it has large quotations from from her letters as well as a little um uh, you know um not really a diary but scrapbook entries yeah. thank you um so rebecca just commenting on on what we've already reflected on um it strikes me saint elizabeth understood the value of suffering and its purpose for life and sanctification like you've ex like you you expanded on father that's uh, very true and then rebecca also asks would you say that her love of silence was that she preferred to listen to god more than to speak to him mm. um do you know in preparation for this i did write some <laughs> notes about silence let me let me see if she has a quote about that um uh, i i would be immediately thinking that you know there would be 
to an exceptional degree, um, she was aware of the communing of w with God, using that word communal, uh, maybe a popular buzzword from previous decades. By it, but it's 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 very um, it's it's very true. And so, in a relationship, it's it's both, isn't it? You know, there's there's the desire. In which, but I, I would err on if you had to put it on an airing. Yes, I think that she, she would rather listen than speak. I think that's true. Um, but the listening leads to the outpouring of the soul automatically, and then you know, um, it, the good listener realizes that there's there isn't a necessity to speak much. After all, isn't that? The, I always quote Frank Duff. You know, um, God gave us two ears and one mouth. So he expects us to listen doubly as well as we are to speak. St. Vincent de Paul, he also says that we are to give twice as much thanks as for what we petition for. So for every prayer answered, there should be twice as much, you know, come back. And, you know, Elizabeth is, is, a, is, a, is a mistress of um, these spiritual lessons. So, yeah, probably listening first. Um, but, but still, in communion with God, that relationship that demands a response. Yes, thank you. And another question from Radio Maculata. Are there any miracles associated with St. Elizabeth during her lifetime? Hmm. Again, my memory is failing me, but I think rather not. I think rather not. Yes. I'd love to, you know, that's one, that's a good one for me to, for myself to go back and, and to look at. I don't think so. I'm not, I, I don't think so. No, but after her death, many. After her many death, was. yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, but in the sense of, you know, uh, things which may, I suppose, like in the sense where we talk about miracles um, in, yeah. in the main, um, we would talk about the providence of God unfolding and certain things providentially, you know, but but not like, for instance, you know, um, St. Clair being able to see through the wall to be able to see Holy Mass taking place or the supernatural aspects like that. Not that I can think of. Yes. Um, so Tara has a short question here. Hello. What was the name of the Belgian male mystic, please? So... His name is Johannes, or Dutch, Belgian, Flemish, you know, Jan, John, Van, Roosbroek. And uh, I suppose in English, is it maybe Roosbroek is maybe the easiest way to, to, to say. Blessed John Roosbroek, if you want to try to Google him. He was, um, he was a canon regular. Uh, so following the rule of St. Augustine, and he, if I remember rightly, from the out from his exalted position um, of what is now the cathedral in Brussels, bearing in mind that was not a cathedral in the 13th century, uh, I think it was, yep, there we go, yeah. Blessed John von Rosebrook, thank you for putting that up. Um, uh, and of course, that spelling of Rosebrook also changes depending on what language you're in, but it doesn't matter. And um, and so he was, uh, yeah, he became a type of, he he wanted to become a hermit and then a kind of community gathered around him um, uh, outside Brussels in, in his, in Brabant, um, uh, yeah, in the 13th century. Okay, thank you. And so we have a question from Nicole now. Um, I might have missed this. I came in late. Who were the saints uh, she looked up to and read about? Right. Uh, so another good question. Uh, it's like one of those things of where, you know, going, I, I would uh, love to be able to quickly go into the back of the index of uh, references and so on and so forth. Um, you know, uh, the principle, as far as Carmel is concerned, certainly St. Teresa of Avila. I mean, that's that goes without saying. That's a sine qua non. Um, you know, her her knowledge, understanding, and love and appreciation of Carmel comes at the hands of La Madre. And if you don't have that, then you're never going to make it as a Carmelite. So definitely St. Teresa of Avila. Um, if you missed the bit on um 
St. Therese of Lisieux, then, you know, having the story of a soul in her possession, but also the various prayers that were um, coming out and being published um, uh, about St. Therese. She absorbed them. She made her, she made them her own. She adapted them. She, she, um, uh, she used them as the foundation for writing of her own prayers. Um, St. Elizabeth, uh, the biblical Elizabeth, uh, particularly important to her in her relationship with Mary. Um, for the rest, I would be making it up if I was now to say, uh, as we can more commonly say, you know, like with St. Therese of Lisieux, say with Joan of Arc and so on and so forth. There's certainly um, something to be said that she was also like all the French in the 19th century. She loved all the French saints. There's no doubt about that. So as far as, you know, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque and probably St. Um, uh, Joan of Arc, but St. Vincent de Paul and any of the great French, you know, the French. There's such a wonderful um, uh, school, uh, St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the name now that comes out of um, uh, Sanso Peace, that spirituality. Um, this also was, was influential with her. And all, you know, the books that we know that were on her bookshelf, these have all been catalogued and so on and so forth, and they follow the same line. Okay. Okay, thank you very much father that's that's it for the questions um so just for the viewers before we conclude um we have a quarterly magazine um on our lady's co-redemption the links in the description on our lady's uh, role as co-redemptrix so please look in the description and, and click on that you can either buy a hard copy of the magazine or um or a pdf an online pdf as well um Okay, so before we conclude, uh, Father, um, could we would you mind leading us in the Angelus prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary. And she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy own Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thine, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt amongst us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy own Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us, and may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. And would you mind uh, giving us a final blessing? Sure. I bless you, especially with this relic, the first class relic, ex possibus, so of the bone of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Benedictio de omnipotentis, Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti, descendant to the Vos, et Manit Semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. Dear gracias. God bless. <laughs>